Um, I'm Elizabeth Whitman. I am an archival specialist working in the office of the city clerk of Chicago. I'm Paul Hughes. I'm a graduate student here at Northeastern Illinois University, and I'm an intern at the uh, Illinois Regional Archive Depository here at Northeastern. Uh, we, we don't have a great number of things from city office holders, but the only thing I can think of is we have some records from Mayor Richard J. Daly's administration from his public relations office. Our mission is to be a place to archive city or government documents, period. So we have things from Cook County. The largest selection is we have the records for the Common Council or the City Council of Chicago from the very beginning in the 1830s up to about 1940. We have a lot of scattered bits and pieces of records for various other agencies though. So we have about 30 years of board registry books for the Cook County Hospital. Um, we have various miscellaneous documents from the school to the school board. Uh, nothing in any long extended areas though. We also have the records of the various villages and towns that were merged into the city that were annexed to the city in the late 1890s. So we have the, the records for Hyde Park, Lake, Lakeview, Jefferson, Rogers Park, Norwood Park, when they were villages or, or cities before they became part of the city of Chicago. Uh, we also have some vital statistics records, so birth, birth uh, certificates, marriage certificates, and death certificates, but um, most of them is outside the city of Chicago in Cook County before um, about 1910, and varies depending on what type. So it's a it's a huge body, but a very small amount of what's what's possible. Okay. Um, and then we have some naturalization records from the Superior Court and Circuit Court. Um, once again, this is compared to all of the naturalizations. It's not very many. Most of the naturalization records are with the Federal Archive because they uh, they did it in federal courts, and we don't have them after 1926, I think. Can I ask you to elaborate on the city council proceedings documents since that is, uh, I guess, the largest part of your collection, right? It's the biggest chunk. Okay. I don't know if, it, you know, as, as a single thing, it, it's really large. Uh, could it's about 300 cartons of documents in folders. Uh -huh. It varies a great deal. There are huge areas of it where it's just um, one single page ordinance after another um, authorizing sidewalks to be built or uh, streets to be paved. But then there are other things in there. There are committee reports of various types. Um, there are a lot of plans for improvements. There are annual reports from various departments. So the, the uh, Department of Public Works annual reports are usually in there. Uh, the Cook County Hospital, or the, you know, for whatever reason, that we usually have those in there too. Um, but various, you know, the various different branches of the city government would sub submit their reports. Um, there's a lot of material on, on elections. There'll be poll books that will list all of the, the precincts and um, reproduce all of the posters that they would use at the time for elections. The city clerk uh, is often thought of as the resource person or the place you go to get your vehicle stickered for wheel taxes. However, the, uh, there's a section in the office called the city council division and we work directly with the city council uh, on legislation and that meaning that the, the individual documents, ordinances, orders, etc. that are issued uh, come to our office uh, to be filed once they have been enacted or if, or even if they've uh, failed to pass. And so that is uh, a great deal of what we have uh, in storage. And that mirrors what Paul was saying about the, uh, the documents related to different parts of city government, et cetera. Uh, the ones that are like reports, et cetera, are f called placed on file documents. So you might find something there that never was part of the legislation. It could just be mentioned uh, that it was received. Um, 
In addition, at one time the city clerk seemed to be a manager of some of the committee records, so we also have certain committee records going back to uh, the turn of the 20th century. Uh, and those files are very interesting because a lot of the records uh, show how things were decided or what was brought to the city council for um, for review, et cetera, before it's gone into legislation. Um, and the city council division where I work uh, is also responsible for then putting together a uh, proceedings document, the Journal of Proceedings, and those are another big part of what we have in our office. They are printed, uh, the copies we have, the IRAD has uh, handwritten ones that uh, go back uh, not as far as the beginning of the printed ones. But uh, And then the other thing that uh, is done is to create an index to those uh, proceedings. And the proceedings basically just go through each committee saying what individual pieces of legislation were presented and uh, then voted on by the city council members. Uh, we do not have records per se of any of the city council members. That's not part of what we do. We do have some records related to the city clerks of the past, and so those are on file and, as well. Uh, in addition, there, the uh, city clerk has some responsibility for maintaining access to the municipal code, so we have copies of the municipal code. A lot of this is also printed material, um, but that's something we, we have a lot of uh, requests regarding, too. The, probably the most interesting one we have is are the city council records, the early ones, and um, in 1984, I think it was, they were discovered in a warehouse. They had just been sitting for decades, and they they were moved down to our our, our location at some point after that. Um, and it's part of the way it's organized now is that they really weren't collected in any way or put together. They're just in they were just in cartons, and that's the way they are now. So that. Uh, there's parts of it that are badly water damaged that you really can't work with at all. Um, uh, parts of it that are probably missing, but it's hard to tell. Um, but it, we we were just here to collect documents, and when that sh showed up, they shipped it to us, and we just kind of said, "Okay, I'll find some place to put it." Uh, in that same collection is also where we picked up the uh, early documents from the villages and towns that were merged into Chicago. A lot of what we get are things that agencies don't have room to store, or, or and they don't really need very much. Uh, I mean, the, the Cook County Hospital just doesn't need their ward registries from the 1920s. So there's no real use for them, so that we hang on to them. Um, they are used by uh, genealogists. Use them a lot, going through looking for for relatives. Uh, if they know they died a certain amount of at a certain time, or approximately a certain time, and they and they died in the hospital, they could try and find them at the ward register. Uh, but there's, you know, it's in terms of what the Cook County Hospital does, it they're really pretty useless to them now. So most of it, that's what most of our stuff is: is things that are formerly of use, could still be of use historically, but aren't particularly used in day-to-day -day basis in in the agencies. We haven't added a great deal to our collection in in quite a while. It, it's there's there's not been a lot of, of movement out of the agencies to, to our location, so I'm not sure what reason or what reasoning they use. Um, I'm also not convinced that the people that are maintaining the records in the agencies necessarily know that they can send it to us, so that it, they could be saying, "Well, we have to do something with this," and, and they end up discarding it because they don't realize that they can send it. Um, but until 1976, there was no, there were no archives. There was the state archive down in Springfield, but in terms of, of archives to take care of local governments to, 
uh, documents. The, that doesn't start until 1976. IRAD doesn't exist, or uh, Northeastern IRAD doesn't exist until 1987. So until then, they really didn't have any place to send them. And it was really hit and miss what they would keep and what they wouldn't keep. Um, that's how the, the city council papers ended up in a warehouse, is somebody put them there to store. And that's it. Nobody ever went back to check. Um, so that they just sat there. Uh, windows got broken so that they got wet and animals were living in there so that they got pretty well, uh, parts of it got pretty badly damaged. Um, but yeah, it, it's real hit and miss what we get and, and what has survived. It's, it's not like we can now go back and get records from 1880. I mean, it's, it's either we've got them or they're probably gone at this point. Although occasionally things turn up. Um, the fact that there are Cook County uh, hospital records here uh, could be a result of some of the records that were once part of a Cook County archives, uh, hospital archives, uh, moving here, but I'm not sure of that. It's possible that the uh, records are still with the Cook County Hospital that I remember from times past, uh, but that uh, Archivist has been gone from there for some time, so I'm not sure. Just, just to give you an idea, with the uh, we have the early records of the Cook County Coroner's Office, which is now the Medical Examiner's Office, and uh, we got a call from the Medical Examiner's Office wanting to know if we knew how we got those, because they were curious why we had them and they didn't. Um, so it, it's. It's really fortuitous when things show up. It, it's um, and there's not a lot of design to what gets archived and what doesn't. The records that are in the city clerk's office today are basically records uh, from the 1940s forward, except for certain committee records that have come have been found. Um, as Paul said previously, in the 1980s. Uh, the city uh, deputy clerk, if I'm not mistaken. Is it uh, John Daly? No, um, no. Dan Burke okay. is his name, I think, uh, was in touch with the state archives. Um, this may also have been a result of when uh, Mayor Washington became mayor, the, uh, he invoked the Freedom of Information Act and every department was supposed to know what records it had. Uh, this is the lore amongst archivists in Chicago. Um, but in any case, uh, before I got there, uh, the, there was some arbitrary date given for when these proceedings records or uh, documents of the city council um, actions uh, were decided to, to send some to become part of this IRAD. And some state in uh, the city. The uh, state archives people came and did inventories in, in the city clerk's office. And I think it was at that time that they probably discovered that they had this off-site storage. And as Paul has described, uh, uh, really bad storage conditions, not uh, like off-site storage that the city clerk's office has today, which is vaulted storage for historical records. Uh, but lo and behold, yes, they were discovered to be in existence, and, uh, and they had further made the decision that the older records should be made more accessible. And when the Illinois State Archives was developing the IRAD system um, and the one for Chicago, those records were obvious uh, candidates for coming here, I assume. Um, like I said, it was before my time, but uh, that's what I understand from uh, local lore, if you will, uh, because of state archives and local other local historians uh, and archivists who are interested in the records. Um, the um, records in our office basically continue to come. That's the provenance of, the, of what the city clerk uh, still holds. So if you want a, a, a document from 2015, we have it. 
but for anything prior to the 1940s, uh, pretty much they are here at the IRAD. So that's the main division between the two collections that way. Now, my opinion of why the, the division in the 1940s came about was that somebody may have thought that the records from the 1940s forward were still needed for administrative purposes in the city, at City Hall, whereas um, the, the older records uh, probably aren't, were in not the best shape and stuff and needed more attention, and so um, they needed to be, and they needed to be accessed, I think. And I think the 1940s date was an arbitrary, somewhat arbitrary uh, decision because I don't know, the state archivist, I think, was involved. Um, can ask me how, how many shelves you've got? We yeah. can fit back to 1940, can't fit back to 1930. These committee records of the city council committees, that is, that we happen to have, I believe, uh, in part came to the city clerk's office because I noticed that some of the records uh, of the minutes indicate at the bottom the name of the city clerk uh, on them. So whether or not a staff person of the city clerk's office was taking minutes for the committees or received, that was part of the procedures at the time that those committee records were sent to the archives, or to the clerk's office rather, um, I don't know. But it's, it is very um, hit and miss. Uh, we don't have, for instance, Committee on Finance records from the 1920s, that they're much later that they start. Some of the most, the most popular set of documents that, that we have here at IRAD are a, a quirky little set of documents called the Chicago, City of Chicago Film Censorship Documents, or record. And um, until the 1980s, the city ran a committee of six people who looked at all movies that were um, not X-rated, it had to be R-rated or, or, or safer, to decide whether they were safe for children to watch. And then they would re re make recommendations and say whether you could, you know, you know, children could watch them or not. And they produced a card for every single movie that came out from, from Hollywood in which they rated the thing and described what was wrong with it, if um, you know, if there was a problem with it, and what they wanted to get rid of. So in this one, there's a scene where Father's paramour has, is seen coming from the bedroom dressed in a slip, and they really didn't like that. Was, you can't show this movie because of that. Um, it takes up probably about 20 boxes, but we have film scholars coming in to look at that. We've got a um, couple people that come in and look at it about once every two months, and they're working their way through trying to, to sort it all out. The most popular uh, after that would probably be the Sanborn Atlases. We have a whole series of Sanborn Atlases. It's not really complete, uh, but they were put to use by the Department of Public Works. And that's what these look like. They show, and this, this is about four blocks worth of the city. Does the entire city at that scale and shows every single building that was built at that time. And the public Department of Public Works, as things changed, as they added streets or they added buildings, would paste over paper and, and uh, draw in the, in the new configuration so that you can track how the city changed over time. Um, it's a little tricky. You have to sit there and hold up the light and try and read through and see what was underneath the things that they pasted over, but you can try and you can track it through that way. And after that, probably, it is the city council records. It's just be because it is so big, and it's primarily used by historians. We get people coming from all over the country. This past summer, we had a, a scholar come from Germany looking for um, context between the city council and, and the and German government. Uh, he spent about two, three days here going through various documents. And it, it's, yeah, it's probably the, the most interesting one, but just to a smaller group of people.
I find the documents dealing with the towns that were annexed into the city to be fascinating and interesting and um, as far as I know I'm the only person that's using them so uh, I would say those are underutilized but yeah you look at like for instance the Rogers Park index or Rogers Park documents cover from 1878 until 1892 when it was merged in and it shows a town and or village being created and what would they were interested in and it is at a time when the cities are changing a great deal so that Rogers Park, which is this very small village, builds their own water system. They, they put in a sewage system. They put in electricity. They, uh, they start paving streets. Uh, they put in sidewalks. Then they move from wooden sidewalks to slate sidewalks to concrete sidewalks. Um, the trains, the uh, commuter trains, arrive in this period. Uh, there's one line that's there slightly before, but the, the uh, train that's now the CTA, that the red line, comes in in the 1880s. So there's just a lot that changes in there, and it's a very small area, so you can really get your, your hands out and get and really understand what was going there on there instead of trying to understand all of what's going on in Chicago. Um, Hyde Park is another one that's interesting. It it's, uh, originally ran from 31st Street all the way down to 115th Street and from the lake over to uh, State Street include places like Pullman and Grand Crossing. Grand Cro they're both early industrial neighborhoods and as well as Hyde Park, which is a residential neighborhood. Uh, and it includes the area that the Columbian Exposition's in. So there's a, just a lot going on in that particular neighborhood. And, um, and the records are there up to, I think, 1888. After that, it's, it's part of the city again. Because our records are, are fairly recent, the most popular requests are for specific documents often. Um, and when I say recent, it could be that since 2000 even, um, but it could be something from, say, the 1960s, 70s. Uh, a lot of things were being under development in Chicago, and so uh, the, the there's current uh, planning and things that go on in neighborhoods and places in Chicago that that had planning and et cetera in those, uh, those time periods, uh, especially since World War II. Um, and uh, the, uh, I lost the train of time. Um, the, uh, the, the thing that's interesting, if you go to the Journal of Proceedings, um, and you're looking for something in the past, you may run across a statement, the plan of development or the, the detailed agreement, et cetera, was not published, but is on file with the city clerk's office. And so those are part of the document series, and people are requesting those um, and most, since most of that is in off-site storage, we have to request it. Uh, but that, that's the kind of things that seem to be more popular. Like I say, individual ordinances related to specific um, things that are of still current interest in, uh, in the wards or uh, for different legal reasons, etc. cetera. Uh, the least known and uh, materials that we have, I think, are the committee, city council committee records. Those uh, records have so much more detail about why they voted for a certain, a certain way on certain things. Um, for instance, a, uh, in the 1950s, there uh, was some horrific incident that um, because they were interested in, in making sure that didn't happen again. Um, they changed the law, and if you go to the files uh, of proceedings uh, or document series, the uh, you get photographs, you get blueprints, plans, etc., that are not in the proceedings. The proceedings just say this was this is what we're voting on. This this change in the city ordinance, and the other materials were put together and used by the committee and then filed with the final ordinance, which may be um, 
a few pages, whereas the other documents really supplement the uh, and give you more of a picture of why things were why that particular ordinance or law was enacted. The particular incident I recall um, was a uh, fuel truck of some kind traveling through the city, and it exploded or there was an accident, and so the things that were filed w with that ordinance that pr now, pr I guess, changed where they could drive fuel trucks in Chicago uh, included everything from photographs of the, of the aftermath, the burned out truck, the neighborhood in that area where they drove, um, f uh, even things from the coroner's office for people who were killed. Um, that kind of thing. Um, also, uh, uh, in that in those files, when they were building all the highways, or as they called them, the super highways, uh, they have dozens and dozens of pictures of the properties that were taken over for building those expressways, as as well as uh, maps and things that show all this uh, activity. Um, but. Uh, the, uh, like I said, the, the, these are kind of coming through the committees and then later perhaps uh, more from uh, city departments that were providing the information uh, for the council people to vote on uh, for legislation. Well, I think that most of the records we have in the city clerk's office um, are all underutilized because I don't think people, unless you are aware of how the city government works, you don't necessarily know what we have. But the um, uh, the things that I saw via the committee records and then are reflected in the um, documents include housing issues and for uh, people after World War II especially for returning veterans. Um, and then eventually they started the uh, trying to uh, do something for the blighted areas. And that started a whole lot of urban renewal. Um, and in fact, those are the terms you need to look in the index under urban renewal, uh, et cetera, to, to even find all this planning and development that went on. And um, sometimes the people who use the archives or the records now may be working on an area of the city uh, for planning and development that goes back to that era, so they need to go back to those documents, et cetera. Um, the, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of, no, that, I think that's yeah, that Can I just add one piece to that where our records don't go up, to, don't go past 1940, but they they still impinge upon or have an effect upon this area that you're talking about. So it's a, the there's a committee on subways and and superhighways. It's actually the name of the committee that started meeting in in the 30s. And so things like the Eisenhower Expressway, the 290, it is actually planned and laid out before World War II. I mean that it's the the plan for it is there in, in the mid-30s, and they built it pretty much exactly the way they put it in the plan in the 30s. Um, I-55, the Stevenson, was built, was planned in the 30s, too. So that uh, a lot of these things are going on in that er much earlier. Um, there are a lot of city reports dealing with a lot of social issues, too, so that uh, there's, for instance, there's a report in 1914 uh, from Carter Harrison's office, I think, um, talking about unemployment and, and what should we do about the unemployment uh, that anticipates in a lot of ways what they end up doing in the, in the New Deal in World War, uh, before World War II. And so that there's just lots of things scattered throughout these records that um, you don't necessarily think of as being government or city government type issues or being at issues at the, the time that we normally think of it. You don't think of superhighways or expressways until the 50s, but they'd been thinking about superhighways long before that. 
they designed these things, they designed these roads for the city as it existed in 1930, and then they didn't change them. And then when you build them in the in the 50s, they talk about how um, Daly is trying to destroy the Italian neighborhood, and that sort of you know, uh, rhetoric that was out, and it's kind of like, um, that was the effect, perhaps, but this had been planned long before Daly was in office, and um, and they just continued on with it as it existed. And they had made a lot of choices based on conditions in the 30s that weren't necessarily still valid. So yeah, it could make, you know, somebody should look at it. Um, when I finish everything else, I'll take a crack at it. Yeah. I think uh, some of the things that I've seen from the 19, later 40s documents that we have uh, show that the, the uh, how the city reacted like in conjunction with the war um, and what was needed, et, et cetera. Um, the uh, the post-war uh, uh, and the GI Bill that brought so many people back who needed to be educated and housed and all that. Um, and that's all definitely government issues, uh, federal government issues. Um, and the, the thing is that you can always see in these documents to the current time, different resolutions, et cetera, that the city council will make you know, to either Congress or the president or both, or even to the governor um, related to uh, issues of concern, um, so you can find a lot of different things like that uh, connected to the U.S. government. It doesn't come up as often in in the earlier records, but it does come up with um, in and usually in surprising places. So um, Chicago was a port, and anything that you did on the lakefront, you had to get the approval of the. Um, the, the Department of the Navy, basically, um, or depending on what time it was, but to, to build anything, to when they they filled in the, the to make the land to make Grand Park, they had to go to the federal government to get approval for that, for uh, altering the, the lakefront because it was a port, uh, and so they turn up at various times, um, and they're involved in funding on a lot of things even in back into the 19th century. Anything to do with with the waterways is going to involve the the, the federal government. Um, if you go far enough back, you, you've got the they're involved with the Indian um, problems, clearing clearing the Native Americans out of the north and the south side of the city. So you know, the Indian boundary is is still a, a major line in the city. It's, it's uh, Rogers and uh, Avenue and Hyde Park or Rogers Park. Then Indian Boundary Park, and then it's down. Oh, there's a Forest Preserve Road down on the south, on uh, the west side, and that's all right along the Indian Boundary line. I guess um, maybe just while we're still on more topical issues, because I think we'll kind of move move on. Um, I'm wondering, you know, one thing we were discussing recently is um, the way in which uh, it can be kind of difficult to understand. Um, the kind of inner workings of political parties in history, the, given the kind of political nature of these documents, um, you know, I think we have an expectation that, um, like, like government documents are public, and yet, like, the kind of inner structures and inner workings of political parties tend to be like, more obscure. Do you feel like, you know, looking at probably the Democratic Party, but maybe even farther back in history, the Republican Party, do these documents kind of reveal anything about um, party dynamics and you know the kind of politics in that? sense, um, do any interesting issues come up? Not, not frequently. I mean, you get glimmerings of them. If you already knew what you were looking for, then you would see things. Um, you'll notice it in terms of changing administrations. Um, you get, you know, in the period that our documents cover, there, there actually was a two-party system in the city and the Republicans and Democrats would trade back and forth for various offices. Uh, but it doesn't show up terribly much in, in the actual proceedings. Uh, it does show up in some of the small town, you know, like Rogers Park, that you see the political campaigning. 
but they're fighting over issues that it's it's are really really local at that point. Uh, but yeah, you know, a lot of politics is local. It's you know who's going to be the justice of the peace. Um, well, I'm not a historian, but I would say uh, the way you can use the, the government documents to understand more about politics um, that we have in these two collections are um, by understanding the, the generally what the political nature of things are going on in Chicago uh, from other sources and then coming and the records of the city council uh, and who's on the city council, uh, who's chair of what committee, et cetera, all makes more sense in view of what you know of political situations coming back. Um, you see at the time of every new uh, mayor, there's all the committee chairs, et cetera, change, and there's reasons for that. And so that's part of the background that goes with some of the political process. I should add that um, in some of the records that I discovered we had from the city clerk, the actual administrative records, uh, at least one of the clerks um, who was there from the 1950s to the 1970s uh, was involved with the, not only the Democratic Party but the uh, uh, Polish American community. and. I, for whatever reason, the, some of those records are in those files. But I think that that's not the usual situation uh, in in the records that we receive. And I, I think it's important to remember that the earlier years that the political parties are not anything like the political parties today. So that um, it shows up in different ways. So there's there is a Democratic Party in Chicago, but it's a coalition of a hundred different little party organizations. You know, there's a, a neighborhood or an alderman's office or um, a precinct organization, and they make deals so that uh, these five ward bosses get together and decide they're all going to sponsor so-and-so to be the run for city clerk, and then be, or they're going to get behind the mayor and then when the election is over, the, the, the chairman's uh, ships of the committees all switch around because they're now, um, their candidate is the one that's in power. Uh, but a lot of that you, you kind of got to know going in. It, it doesn't really show up in the documents. So that uh, in a lot of ways the newspapers are a lot better source for that type of information. But you really should look at both. I mean the. Um, the newspapers and the politics will give you context for what it is that's going on in the city. Um, it's hard to narrow it down. I mean, we have, I don't know, about a million documents, so to pick out a favorite is kind of odd. Uh, but one of the ones I, I thought of is this is a document, it's a petition from a, a neighborhood on the northwest side for um, prohibition in their precincts. And it's interesting to me because you've got the petition here, which has everybody's signature and their address, but to show where they wanted prohibition, they included a plat map from a real estate company. And it's, you know, it shows the city at, at that time. But on the other side of it is his advertising. And it gives you information about the city that you don't get any other place. And, and these are they're very ephemeral. They, they, you know, they, they were printed and then thrown away. And so it's hard to find these things. But it includes information about how much houses cost, what churches were in that neighborhood, what railroad lines were going in, uh, how much it cost to take a train from this neighborhood downtown, how long it, it took to, to make that commute. Uh, it gets into... This one doesn't. I've seen others where they get into what the terms are for, for buying property. Uh, not just buying the property, but this guy will also then build the house for you if you want. Uh, and it, and it, from a standpoint of just graphic art, art history, some of them are, are really nice to look at. 
Um, some of them are interesting because it's so awful to look at. But, uh, but th those are some of my favorite types where it's, this is, if you look at it at an index, it just says this is a petition about prohibition in a precinct. But the, the things that go with it are sometimes much more interesting. So you actually have to sit there and go through it box by box and try and find what it is that you want to look at. An historian will look at this and be interested in a number of different things. It's from 1901, um, so it's prohibition has become a big issue in, this, in the country as, as a whole. An historian that would look at this would probably want to know who it was that was living there. Is, is, um, the, one of the things you'd have to figure out is this map, plat map, shows a lot of streets and lots on it. Um, this, but very often these are kind of aspirational. They've, they've laid out the lots, but they haven't sold any of them yet. So this, this could be basically an empty neighborhood. In this case, we're pretty sure it's not because we have people that actually signed petitions saying they lived there. As you go through it, though, get further back, we have Martin H. something, and he owns all of these lots, and it keeps going. He's the real estate developer. Those are all the lots he's got for sale. So that's about maybe a quarter of the lots in this land, in this area, aren't sold yet. You then probably would want to go through all these names and start trying to figure out, is there any ethnic background here? Is this a German neighborhood, a Polish neighborhood? Uh, you know, it, is there a relationship between what these people, where these people are from and prohibition? Um, I'm not sure if you could get it from this, but you'd probably want to know what do these people do for a living? Is this a, a working class neighborhood? Um, it's the north, far northwest side at this point. It's, it, um, it's, not, it's not around uh, Montrose. It's, a, it's actually the neighborhood is, is Mayfair. I'm not quite sure what it was at this point, but I don't think it was industrial yet. And I, I couldn't tell you what it was ethically. But a historian would want to look at all of those things and, and try and figure it out to tell what this meant. You'd kind of want to know what's going on with the railroads, too, because it, it's actually an interesting neighborhood for railroads. This is the Chicago Northwestern Line, which is coming out from downtown. And they actually, it's, I'm surprised it's already on here, there's something called a Mayfair Cutoff. And it's a rail line that will go from the town the neighborhood of Mayfair up to Evanston, and it's industrial all along that uh, railroad line. So these people could be factory workers or working class. And, uh, I, you know, I'd have to go do a lot more work to figure that out. But it's a good start. Well, uh, in the uh, collections that we have for the city council, um, the committee records to me are the are the most fascinating. I think I mentioned that before. Um, local transportation seemed to be most interesting to me for a variety of things. But the one document there that I found um, was a petition from the Negro Chamber of Commerce. I don't know if that's the correct name of the group, but it was done in the 1930s and it was to petition that the presumed, uh, what eventually became the CTA, that this and the, that the city would own and operate. Um, the, the petition was for uh, African Americans to be able to not only be uh, use the system that when it was uh, completed, but that they also be employed by uh, as what became CTA uh, employees. And it took all the way to uh, 1945 when the ordinance was passed to create the CTA. And if you read the ordinance, you can definitely find that they paid attention to exactly what that petition said, that they did put in there, you know, uh, information about employment and use that, that was to the wishes of that group. Um, and I thought that that was uh, most interesting that it even was there because, again, like the com somebody in that committee must have retained it because uh, it wasn't an official record of the, the city council. 
uh, that you know was never a document of the city council, but it but it was filed with it. So. Was there federal funding for the construction of the city's subway system in the 30s and 40s? And mm -hmm. did that affect it? Because I'm just thinking about the federal, the Fair Employment Practices Committee that Roosevelt created during the during World War II, and I wondered if if there was any connection between the FEPC, which was advocated for by Philip Randolph, who you know was the head of the Pullman sleeping car porters, and he would have obviously had connection to uh, African American groups in Chicago. So I'm, I'm wondering, going back to Ed's question of sort of ties between federal policy and city government, if if you have any sense of a connection there in that document. Um, in I terms of the subways? Yeah. Because the subways is, is the 30s. Yeah. And so it would be before. Right. And, and some of the issues that do pre uh, go back to the older things, but uh, from the standpoint of the post-war era, you definitely see things related to fair housing, like I said before, the GI Bill, um, and uh, then you get into the whole era of the uh, fixing the, the blight, what they called the blighted areas, and that definitely had government funding. Um, not sure about the superhighway system, what funding came from that, from the government, but I uh, suspect that that would be uh, true, too. I, I know in our part of the record there are a lot of documents about the subways, building the subways. Um, it's mostly what I've seen, though, are construction documents, and trying to decide where the subway was going to connect to the existing network, and then the, all the, there's tons of architectural drawings and elevations for how they were going to build the subways. Those kind of stand out though when when you go through, and and I've never, you know, I've never looked at it to find out about that. I would guess there are some documents in there about the funding and the federal funding because it um, it certainly sounds like a project that the the federal government would have used to try and put, you know, get money spent to get the economy going. Uh, I've had a couple people coming through with projects. Um, typically, they just ask us where documents are. They don't really tell us what they're doing, mm -hmm. uh, so you don't necessarily know. But um, I, I had one person who was interested in looking at the Cook County Coroner's records to do a project on how the way people died changed over the course of the, 20, uh, the late, 20, late 19th, early 20th century. Um, we had a, recently we had somebody come in looking for coroner records for women who died violently in a kind of Jack the Ripper style because there was working on some idea that um, Jack the Ripper was really from Chicago so um, some of them are serious and some of them you help you just help them anyway i think that's what i consider a problem i don't think that there are enough people who understand the, what records we have and what records will show to them about the history of chicago um, on the other hand uh, current administration sometimes comes up with questions about uh, suspected ordinances. Uh, one was about, was there an ordinance that prohibited people from fishing in their pajamas? I don't know if that should make the cut, but <laughs> in any case, um, some of them are rather, we do get frivolous requests for, can you tell me, and then what you'd have to do is find every ordinance on a given topic. Um, Sometimes we do some of these requests. Um, I should point out that uh, to avoid some of these repetitive questions, uh, the city clerk in the past has made lists of things. And these are different pieces of legislation regarding X or Y or whatever. 
uh, for instance, in Chicago, you have residential parking zones uh, for crowded neighborhoods. And so they made lists of those kind of things, very practical things. The majority of people using the city, but records are in the city clerk's domain still, are people who are actively doing something in regard to city, the city. So uh, real estate, um, different issues related to uh, planning, I think, uh, a lot of things like that, legal issues uh, that come up when new transactions happen regarding uh, a past agreement or whatever, uh, that kind of thing. Um, I, we, we don't get as many historians uh, using our collection. Um, I, again, I don't know if this will make the cut, but another thing that happens is uh, in, in government you get freedom of information uh, requests. And for the most part, the ones that I see seem to be questions that if you came to the IRAD, they would just help you find the information, whereas people expect that you have to s submit a FOIA to get the records. However, that's not the case. To, you know, if you ask the question, we'll try and find the record and, and provide that information to you. It, it's, we're not, we don't have the kinds of records because all of the uh, city council proceedings, et cetera, is published, it's public, and you, you should be able to just ask for it, in my opinion. Um, but if you do do a FOIA, it will re be, re uh, you will receive the information. Um, I know in IRAD, uh, genealogists were always a, a big chunk of what we did, uh, but that is in, every year that's a little less true. I mean, the, so much of genealogy and the things that genealogists want to see is available online now that they don't have to come to us to get it. So that um, a lot of what we do, or where we get people in to look at things and are useful, are the things that we have that are unique. Uh, so that if you want to look at the city council proceedings before 1940, you have to come here. This is the only place you can get them. Um, and, and a great number of our records, the ones that are used a lot, are, are that type. So it's, it's, we still do an awful lot of genealogy. Um, a lot of it is things that they could do on their own and they don't really need us to do. But the, the important part of it is probably the, still the historical things. And it's used in a lot of different ways. It's just not academic historians. We get people coming in that are um, architectural preservationists looking for information. Um, there's an awful lot of independent historians doing uh, various projects. Of, uh, we had one guy who's writing a, a piece on Frank Lloyd Wright and um, talking, writing about his affair that he had with a woman in, in Hyde Park, uh, so that he was looking for information that we might have. So you get some serious academic, and, and but also an awful lot of uh, just people interested in, in history for various you know, purposes. I think the main thing that I would say for uh, academic historians is that the uh, city council proceedings the, the published uh, narrative of what happened at City Council is kind of the end of the story, whereas all these other documents that go before um, are, are, um, are very, to me, very interesting and add to the story. I would say that um, if you just came and said, give me from your collection on a particular topic, it would be very difficult to say, you know, where to start um, unless you had something specific that you bring to the records. I think, um, you know, like say like the Capone era or something like that, you, you, you really have to know when things took place and, and um, when and where the city government 
intervened or or did some kind of um, uh, proposals, et cetera, that, that you would have evidence in the records. Um, but I think if, if it's a, a social issue in Chicago, you're bound to find something in the city council records related to it. And it might be, uh, you know, adding um, more depth to what you find in, say, as Paul mentioned earlier, the newspaper accounts. Uh, it'll show, yes, this did happen. You know, you can see here they did vote on this, et cetera. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure what topics, uh, all the topics that could be um, come up with, but uh, unless you sat and read through the city council legislation, I don't know that you would necessarily, um, uh, and I don't think you want to do that. Uh, yeah, there's not many of us have that much time. Yes, and uh, frankly, as, as Paul alluded to, a lot of the ordinances are for very simple things, for putting up a handicap sign and on a, you know, in front of a house. Um, an or, honorary street name. Honorary street names, or uh, in order to um, uh, put up a signboard. Uh, these very common things, uh, making a one-way street, those aren't the earth-shaking things, uh, but that's part of the documentation too and part of the proceedings, whereas the, uh, the, the legislation or what they even in our office calls, uh, you know, the main, uh, main, I forget what they call it exactly, but the important legislation, if you will, that addresses topics of current uh, interests. Um, that's the kind of thing that that uh, probably you can make pay on, if you will. Um, just recently, I had a request to find when the city council adopted some ordinance declaring Chicago a sanctuary city. That was in the 1980s. Um, after much research, we could not find anything that the city council did. It turned out it was Mayor Washington made an executive order. And the fact that the executive order exists may re be recorded in the city council minutes, but that's legislation that's apart from the city council. Uh, turns out then in recent times they adopted an actual uh, resolution on the part of the city council related to immigration uh, that, you know, will be in the record. Uh, another uh, uh, aspect that I almost forgot about that we have, uh, starting in the mid-1970s, we have a most un underutilized group of records. We have uh, sound recordings of city council proceedings so that unlike the city council journal that's written, which is very cut and dried, this is literally the actual, um, you know, the entire discussions that went on at city council. Uh, and they are inaccessible in part because of the format. They are in reel-to-reel -reel tape, cassette tape. One time they were doing audio tapes. Um, now you can find, uh, the quote unquote archived video that's streamed from the live stream coverage of city council meetings on the city clerk's website. But uh, hopefully, sometime those audio recordings will be somehow made available. I think you could go through the material here and write articles. You could probably get books out of it, mm -hmm. um, particularly um, some of them. I'm not sure it, how it would work, but um, for instance, some of the, the dullest things in there are all the sidewalk ordinances. They will go on, you'll be a, a folder with a hundred ordinances and each ordinance is to pave or to create sidewalks for one block or two blocks in the city. And if somebody that knew an awful lot more about GIS than I do were to work with that, they could go through and plot out the time frame on when sidewalks were built across the city. 
and from that you can start to um, make it uh, make draw conclusions about where people actually lived. So you, you look at plat maps, they lay out where streets are going to be. It doesn't necessarily mean anybody's built that street yet. Even if they've built the street, that doesn't mean they managed to sell any of the real estate. So you get plat maps, maps from, say, 1874, 1872, right around the time that the, the economy uh, went into depression in 1873. Well, there's, there's nothing built on those. There won't be anything built on them for another 10 years. But they're also not going to build the sidewalks until somebody lives there because the way they build sidewalks is it increases your tax, your property tax. So until there's somebody to pay the property tax, they won't build the sidewalk. So you can go through and, and tell where people actually lived if, if you worked with those. Um, it'd be a really, really big project. You'd, you'd have to look at hundreds of thousands of documents and, and keep track of it. But you could do that. Um, there's got to be tons of things you can do about railroads in the city and, and development of railroads. Uh, the whole problem of elevating the railroads is covered extensively in here. Um, railroad safety, how, you know, the, all the problems involved with having railroads at street level and having street crossings where um, horses, you've, you know, it's still horse-drawn wagons at this point and the horses bolt because the railroad came by and then somebody gets killed. Uh, people try and, and get out and off trains when they're moving and, and they die. There's just lots and lots of material on that in, the, in these records. So that um, there's a, a, a lot of material there that nobody's looked at. Um, all right. Um, and along those same lines, there, there are people that have come in and, and done work. So there's an author named Robert Ein, Robin Einhorn who's written a book looking at the relationship between property taxes and special assessments and improvements. So that um, that whole idea that when you build a sidewalk, that increases the value of, of your property. So that um, she, she looked at the whole idea that, that when you build a sidewalk, it increases the property value of your housing and, and related that to the way uh, taxes were raised and city governments were run. When somebody is looking for something in the records uh, in the city clerk's office, usually they have a topic. Uh, hopefully they have a date to go with it. Depending on the period of time, uh, the first place I would look would be the printed indexes. And this is an example of one from the 1940s. Uh, indexes exist. Um, for all the printed minutes, uh, going back to the earliest ones that have been published, and you can look up if the older indexes. You can look up things such as, you know, like when they did put the sidewalk in. You can look under the name of a street, and there'll be an ordinance for a sidewalk on that street, etc. But if you, you're asking about a specific ordinance, then it could be recorded in the Journal of Proceedings. The index will tell you the page number it's on. Um, and then when you go to the ordinance, you might discover that something was not published as part of the ordinance or, or order, or you're wondering if there's anything else that was uh, placed on file with that ordinance. So then at that point you might request to see the original ordinance, which would be literally the pieces of paper that were put together and presented to the city council and then their committee reviewed it and then brought it back to be enacted or to be uh, voted uh, not pass. Uh, if you're looking for something related to the municipal code, um, again, the index will tell you when the code was changed, et cetera. Oftentimes, we are asked, can you give us a copy of the part of the municipal code that covers a given thing at the exact time that we need, date? Um, they don't publish the municipal code 
literally every time it's changed, it's changed every meeting practically, but we try to uh, narrow down, et cetera, the, uh, the, the time frame and, and find what the text would have been. These seem to be usually for legal reasons. So if somebody was violating the municipal code or what have, or if, a, like say, a building was supposed to have something and they say, well, this predates the code for that, um, then, you know, you can tell. Uh, uh, the city clerk's website right now has the Journal of Proceedings going back to 1983 online. Um, you can do a lot of searching yourself, uh, but if there are questions related to anything you're looking at, you could uh, contact our office and we can find out more for you. Um, and of course, uh, we would if we get questions related for the pre-1940s time period, we would refer them to the, the IRAD for further information. Usually, to find things uh, in the city council records, uh, you, you either are knowing what you need to look for, a specific ordinance, or you suspect that an ordinance or things you're looking at a social topic. Um, so I think you, you don't even have to come to the city clerk's office to access the Journal of Proceedings and use the index. Those are on file uh, at the Harold Washington Library um, in the government document section. The, this uh, Chicago History Museum has a collection. In fact, they have the oldest uh, printed ones that don't exist in any other collection going back to 1858. Uh, there are also copies of the Journal of Proceedings at the Newberry Library. So if you start there, then the questions you'd have for us would be perhaps more specific. Or if it's saying this document was not published but is on file, then you would be asking us for a very specific item. Um, the uh, the main thing is to know that this, too, that the city clerk's website has the documentation from the 1980s forward on the website. Uh, if you just find the phone number for the city clerk's office, uh, call up, and if you have a historical question, it's usually referred to me. Uh, but you just need to have a phone number for the city clerk's office to, to get to me. Um, and uh, if you want to come in, or if it's determined that you need to come in, uh, we'll make an accommodation for that. We do not have like a reading room. We're not set up as an archive. It's an office of the city government. But we will do what we can to make these things available to you there. Also, if you are looking for a very specific thing and we find it and you say, yes, that's what I need, we can scan it and email it to you. I do have email access to people if they want to email me, but again, you could also email inquiries to the city clerk via the website, and that's the easiest way to find. Uh, hopefully it will get to me. I think it should, because uh, that I'm that's what I was hired to do there. This time. In terms of trying to get find out information from IRAD, um, you can either phone or come in, um, depending on how detailed your question is. I, you know, if it's a simple question, you can just phone, and we'll try and do it over the phone, or tell you that you'll have to come in. If it's a really complicated uh, question, you'll have you'll have to come in. Um, we do not have indexes for a lot of what we have. We have indices for a lot of the vital statistics material. There's an index for the coroner's inquests and for the Chicago homicide file. Um, and there's an index for the, at least the beginning of the uh, city of Chicago proceedings. Most of the other, for instance, the small town files don't have an index. Um, things like the, the ward registers for Cook County Hospital that aren't indexed. If, if you're looking for information in those areas, you have to come in and we'll 
help you as much as we can, but you're you're going to have to go through it and and look at it because it's it's there there really isn't any other way to do it. Uh, in in terms of indexes, some of our indexes are online and you can just access them access them through the Cyber Illinois website of the Secretary of State. It includes most of the genealogy, but but it also includes the early years of the city council proceedings, the 1830 to 1871 period. At, at that website, there are also a, a lot of other indexes for other areas of IRAD and, and for the state archive. So that, um, for instance, there is an index there of all the land purchases from the federal government for the initial purchase of land when it was the territory of this early state of Illinois. And uh, those records are available, not necessarily through us, but through the archive somewhere. Um, so that, but that, yeah, basically, where we have indexes, you can find them online. And if you find something, we will go get the document and, and mail it to you. Uh, we, we do not scan and send things by email, though. Another area that we have people come in looking for will be trying to do high school projects or even college projects. We, we have people from Northeastern that will come in looking to do something with primary documents to write some type of paper. Uh, if, if you come in and, and you should, if you come in with some idea of what it is that you want to look for, we will go through and try and guide you to where those documents would be, either here or if we know of them somewhere else. Uh, Frequently, we, we will not have what you're looking for. Um, fr frequently, when high school kids come in, they have a very broad topic and they need to narrow it down. And uh, we, we will also go through it. If you don't have an idea what you want to do, we, we can go through and say, well, we have these documents. Why don't you look at these? This is, this is a, a, a small contained area that you could probably get something out of in the course of a couple weeks. Uh, what you don't want to do is come in and, and try and write the history of the Civil War in, in, the, in Illinois based on our documents or probably for a history fair on anybody's documents because it's just too big a topic. But if, you, if somebody really is just trying to do that type of, of history project work or primary source work as an assignment to do primary source work, then we're more than willing to, to help them and try and find something that they can write about. In the past, we've had people coming in looking for various things. So that, uh, last year for History Fair, somebody came in looking for information on the regulation of milk um, and milk safety. And um, we, we did not have a lot of, on that, but we directed them to Chicago Public Library, who did. Um, if I were to look for something here, Off the top of my head, I can't think of anything. I'd probably, I'd probably look for something in the railroads. I could look. You might want to look at the coroner's inquests, or the, or and see what do something on cause of death. Um, there's a great number of things you could write a small amount, small topic areas about cause of death in, in the 19th century. Um, you could look at some of the small cities, so that you, you could look at the village of Rogers Park and, and see what that could tell you about the founding of the village, or um, there's just some interesting documents in there. There's, I would, you know, I might give them the first document, or the first ordinance that the city of Rogers, or the village of Rogers Park passed was um, an ordinance prohibiting concealed weapons. And it's got to be five pages long, because it's, it's just very, long involved law that they passed with a great list of all the different things that you can't conceal. Um, and so that they could start from there and try and write something about concealed weapons and, or weapon law in Chicago, uh, depending on what else is around. Could but you it also depends on what they're interested in. We, it's, I can't, you got to work with what they're interested in or else they're, they're just not going to be able to do it. Could you work with some issues that have been really, uh, important in current discussions of city politics, like uh, murder, for instance, uh, police violence, the murder rate, you know, I mean, are there, are there sort of um, historical precedents that you could write about on, on those kinds I, of topics? Don't you, you have homicide records here? Homicide, the homicide record is, is probably the least useful r report out there. Oh. Uh, I wouldn't go there. 
it's not really a record of all homicides. It's a notebook maintained by the homicide detectives so they knew when to go to court. So it, it and it's hit and miss. I mean, it, it doesn't have, there's just some of them. So that it, uh, it's a grander title than it is a document. So I don't think I would go there. I, I can't think of anything on films. Oh, yeah. I, I was going to say, I can't think of anything on death that you could do. Uh -huh. Just because it changes how they kept the records keeps changing. They're not really comparable. But yeah, one area they could do is look at the film censorship documents, um, try and go through there and show how, you know, you could do something about how what was objectionable changed over time. Well, I uh, mentioned earlier that one of the things that uh, prevents people from uh, using our records might be the format, um, certain audio records, etc. And yes, there are a lot of uh, records that we hold that are fragile. Um, people want to photocopy things and sometimes you can't even do that. So that's, that's a question. Uh, we don't have a lot of playback equipment for the audio. Uh, we, we, I'm not sure what we can do about the uh, getting photocopies, but since some things have been uh, microfilmed and digitized, etc., it may not be necessary to use the original um, uh, material, and uh, that may be an, uh, point. Um, and again, I, I mentioned that people think they have to use the Freedom of Information Act request to get documents, and that may seem like a, a, a barrier to the records, but these are public records, and you really don't need to do that to get information. But if you feel that you're not getting straight answers somehow uh, from a government office, that's what you need to use. But in the city clerk's office, you know, we'll make whatever available. Probably the, the largest challenge in, in with the records we have are, are there's some areas where the, the records are just in abysmal condition. You, you really just can't use them. Um, it's not that much, but if you just happen to be interested in that particular year, then you're out of luck. Uh, the, probably the next biggest challenge is that the, the records are in the, the order and the fashion that they were arrived and that they were put together by the whoever was that put these council records together below those many years ago. And it, some of it makes sense and some of it doesn't. There will be folders that just have one document number and it's it's will say that it is miscellaneous documents and it will be a five inch thick folder with completely unrelated documents all over the map. I could have um, receipts for um, printing, we have uh, legal documents from this, where the city's being sued, then it'll have ordinances, and it'll have very, very run of the mill things, but mixed in there will be something really interesting. And the only way you can find that out is to sit there and, and just read through all those documents, and, and there's millions of them. So, uh, you yeah, know, where to start and when to know that you're done is probably one of the biggest challenges dealing with some of those documents. I might add uh, that while the intentions were there, it doesn't always come to fruition. The, every time a, a legislative document was passed or failed, it was recorded in, a, in an index of those documents. And as Paul has alluded to, sometimes identifying the documents with the correct uh, meeting, they were passed, etc., is unknown. Uh, and certainly before there was a journal of proceedings, you can't necessarily connect up the pieces, uh, like you said, with when they were enacted or unless there's dates on the materials. But the intention was that each document was identified as it was passed and how the filing system, you know, got went askew is anybody's guess. Uh, 
these were not necessarily documents that were maintained as an archive until the 1980s. So you can imagine um, how things got out of order and, and, and mis misfiled or what have you. Um, I also know for a fact that there have been times when we've referred people to the IRAD for a given document that we know should have been here, but it's not, and that's just because it was taken out of the sequence of files and never replaced. Or it's here, somewhere. It's very possible. But the, uh, the fact that we can't find a document is not something that uh, is the end of the world. If, it's, if you can find the, the proceedings, you may find the substance of what happened. But as I said, as we said before, if it just refers to that this, you know, was passed, et cetera, and, and stuff is on file, then the actual file is, is even more important. Um, but the, uh, the, the system, I think, got better later. Um, but there are even times when it's hard to find documents uh, from like 30 to 40 years ago, just because that wasn't being paid attention to at that time. They were considered working documents. They weren't considered archives. So that's basically an intention of having the collections as we have them is to uh, put them in as good as order as possible based on um, how the records were created and therefore how they, you can logically find them. One, one of the signs that you can read into when you read the documents that they're becoming more conscious of it being an archive and, and more conscious that this is something that you have to keep track of is you'll run into document you look for a document and it won't be there, but there will be a, a, a sheet of paper saying this document was signed out to the Department of Public Works. So it's, we know where it went. We still can't get a hold of it, but. Uh. Yes, record keeping is much better in the recent era so that if you have an ordinance that um, went to committee and was changed radically, uh, by the committee and brought back as a substitute ordinance that was the final ordinance adopted, um, you will have both, both parts are filed together. Um, and in the case of any record from uh, 2010 forward, those, those two different versions are included in the online information uh, in the Legislative Information Center that's that's part of what's on the city clerk's website. In terms of our collection, where we're, we're looking primarily at, at historical materials, it's pre-1940, everything is pre-1940, a lot of it's even earlier than that. We, we end up referring a lot to other institutions in Chicago. Um, Chicago happens to have a lot of resources for history. Uh, probably the first one is the Chicago Public Library, has the downtown collection, the municipal library, but then they also have um, neighborhood collections so that over at Solzer, which is maybe a mile and a half from here, they have a, a large regional Chicago collection of you know things on North Park or on Austin. Um, and that's, you know, it's part of the city, so it, it's free, and they're, they're really, really cooperative and, and helpful. Um, after that, there's probably the Chicago Historical uh, Museum, Chicago, I guess Chicago History Museum, uh, which has a really interesting large collection, and, and they're also very helpful. But it's just, you know, it's, it, it's just a question of whether they have materially what you're looking for. Um, then Chicago has a great number of neighborhood historical societies, so things like the Rogers Park or the Edgewood Historical Society. Um, those are kind of hit and miss in terms of how good they are or what their collections are like. It varies by society depending on how much they, they've got or, 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 or can be useful. But then it also varies from over time. You, know, you could be a, a historical society that's really useful and you go back five years from now and you can't even find them because the, the board of trustees has changed or, or the, they're usually volunteer 
so the volunteers have, have uh, changed and, and they're just not as useful. Um, and then there's the other universities. The University of Illinois Circle, or I guess it's University of Illinois Chicago, has a, a very large collection of, of archives and they're also very, very helpful. Um, Northwestern has some, and but they're helpful. I haven't used Chicago, University of Chicago, but I'm, I'm sure they would be useful too. Uh, that's off the top of my head, That's those are the people I can think of. And, and when you think about <coughs> which ones most often come up in conjunction <coughs> with, um, with research being done here, you would say it's the Chicago Public Library, for example, or? Um, yeah, usually people are looking for something local, and they have the, bo the most local material. Um, and they're also the easiest to deal with in a lot of ways. It is a, ch it is a public library. They're used to dealing with people from the public. They're, they're not professional historians. Um, you know, History Museum is a real, Chicago History Museum is a really good uh, resource. However, it, it, you do have to pay admission to go in to use it, so people are less likely or more unwilling to use that than the Chicago public. Um, some of the academic libraries, you have to be, it, you need a letter from somewhere saying that you're really doing real research. They're, they're not set up terribly well to help the general public. And what about uh, how Elizabeth's uh, collection comes up here? Do, are, are you often referring people to documents held there? Or? We, we see people more often that have already been to their collection and are coming to us than, than the other way around. Um, most of what we're looking at is for older material or older questions about older parts of the city than, than uh, they're going to have much on. Although I, I probably shouldn't assume that. And, um, yeah, that you, nev sense. you never know where things are going to turn up. Right. Well, um, I guess it should be said somewhere uh, that there is no municipal archives in Chicago, per se. Uh, there are government records uh, that we've been discussing uh, that are in our locations, but there are government records that are at uh, such places as the Chicago History Museum. Um, and depending on what it is, if it's a printed source, it could be in several places, like the Journal of Proceedings. Um, the uh, University of Illinois at Chicago has, uh, I'm not sure what their collection development policy is, but they've become the repository for uh, a few recent mayors, uh, most notably Richard J. Daley uh, and Michael Bolandic that I'm aware of. Uh, that collection has uh, online uh, resources, but they, they have finding aids and other informative information about their holdings. So I would recommend that you, you uh, look there as well. Um, the other thing I could say is that because the government records uh, are kind of the ending point. This is what they finally decided about what we're going to do in relation to a social problem or social issues. Uh, that reading some of the historians of Chicago history um, it would be important to, to get a general background. Also, using uh, the online uh, Tribune Historical Archives, and there are a few others that you can access through the Chicago Public Library website. Um, that's how I access them. Uh, those, th that gives you a running narrative to, that's not, it's a primary source, and it, if a high school student, for instance, just used newspapers, that is a primary source. So they, they don't necessarily have to come to the archives. But what they might discover there is references to the city council, to the uh, Cook County government, et cetera, that would lead you back to wanting to know more, that would take you back to the original records that our archives have, uh, or include. Um, it, it, I would just add that a lot of records 
um, are also online. So um, the, the proceedings of the county board are actually not all online, but they're, they've been digitized and um, most of them are available at Google Book. So that increasingly a lot of this stuff is out there, particularly if it was ever printed. Right. Um, the Journal of Proceedings of the City Council uh, have been digitized and are available in the Internet Archive online. Uh, if you type, go into Internet Archive, and you will have to be very precise in how you request it. The City Council of the City of Chicago, the Proceedings of the, the Journal of Proceedings of the City Council of the City of Chicago. That's the entire way you have to look for it, but it is available. And th those digitized records go from uh, 1863 to 1963. That is not the entire collection but, uh, of the records, but that's a good portion of them. If people are looking for um, uh, graphic images, etc., photographs, I mentioned that there are some photographs related to specific legislation. However, if you're looking for um, a visual, more of the visual history of Chicago, I, I would say the Chicago History Museum is the main resource um, for that kind of thing. Um, they, they've just been collecting that kind of thing for a long time, and they are very knowledgeable about their collection. So, um, that's where you would go for uh, for visual historical record. I would say.